So, the finale of Star Trek Discovery is upon us, that hope is you part 2. I'm Rick and spoilers ahead for the episode review. This one was over an hour long so let's just get stuck in, but as a finale however, this episode was very mixed. I like it, but strange choices kept pulling me out of the moment. I'll start by looking into the sections on the Dilithium planet with Sukal before we delve into the scenes aboard the Discovery, but I'll start off by saying that there were few surprises this time, with the big curveball being thrown in in the last episode. There were some annoyances that bugged me just as much now as they did back then, but I'll address them when I get to them. Beginning with the deteriorating Dilithium planet and the stranded crew. The welts formed by the radiation look pretty painful, not gonna lie, and the degradation of the hologrid made for a sense of peril as time ran out. In regards to the failing holodeck, I liked how the edges of the program were frayed, resulting in these little cubes of corrupt data floating about. I am curious as to how the holograms recognised Grey as a separate entity and projected a holographic form around them but we've seen that these holograms can even create illusionary senses, such as Saru feeling although he was walking as a human would, and the burying of their equipment under their projected clothes. Without more explanation of this tech, I can't really criticise the feasibility of it. That and it's, you know, made up Trek stuff. But I think the point was to anchor Grey for Colber, who has never met this person. He believed Adira, but now here's undeniable proof that Grey's consciousness is separated and behaving in a very untrue like form, a mystery and a puzzle to be tackled in the future. As the Elder explained last episode, Sukal is going to have to confront his fear, which is of course the sudden return of reality into his safe fantasy realm. I think the irony here is that his holodeck is nowhere near as safe as it used to be anyway, especially with the addition of the fairy tale monster. Saru's very careful delivery of information was a good way to ground Sukal, making him question things out of curiosity and easing him into the revelation. It seemed obvious in hindsight, but it didn't occur to me that the door through which the kelp creature was captive housed the holodeck controls, and more than that, the dead bodies of the Kieth crew, including Dr. Isa. Young Sukal literally saw his mother die of radiation poisoning, which in turn caused his outburst. So, the cause of the burn is speculated on by Kolba. He comes to the conclusion that the audible cry of Sukal has a subspace frequency to it, which interacted with the surrounding dilithium and caused the burn wave to propagate throughout subspace. I wish they'd focused on this a bit more as they do make it clear that taking him away from the planet will nullify the chances of another burn. So clearly Sukal isn't the source of power behind the wave. A galaxy spanning wave being emanated from Sukal by himself is a bit of a stretch to say the least, so I'm glad some hints were dropped that it was his ability combined with the planet itself, but as a nitpick, I'd like to have seen more on this. Touching on the discovery side of things now, and that is certainly where the action is. Asira goes back to being full on bad guy this time, even choking out Aurelio, which seems a hell of a reversal from their earlier discussions. I clearly have completely misunderstood their level of friendship, feigned or no, but I guess it's a very quick way of illustrating that she's a pretty irredeemable character. I would have thought there'd be more scenes of him attempting to sway her, even if she ultimately rejects him, but there wasn't even a hint of remorse. The rest of the command crew gets a lot to do here, and Awasa can prove to be the surprising star of the show. We already knew from season 2 that she grew up on a Luddite colony, but apparently that included free diving in underwater caves, leading her to be able to hold her breath for up to 10 minutes. I'm going to assume this was without actually swimming, because that enters into, you know, world record territory for static apnea. Of course, if she could oxygenate her blood beforehand, which a Luddite colony probably wouldn't do, you can get up to anywhere between 12 and 24 minutes before you need to breathe. But all this is again without moving much, so kind of irrelevant right now. Point is, she can fare better on low oxygen than the others and is therefore the key to saving the ship. 
I said it before, but it still holds true. I really enjoy it when we get background on these characters and they get their limelight for a while. It makes me care about them, and I was rooting for their survival. I was wondering, however, how the hell were they going to get to the nacelles considering there was a point made about how they were now detached from the secondary hull and the transporters were down, but it looks like they are actually connected again when at warp speeds. However, as for things that make no logistical sense, the turbo lift fight scenes were really cinematic and cool to watch, but I really, really do not like how cavernous and empty they make Discovery look. All this empty space with turbo lifts flying through it is just ridiculous and makes the ship look like it's the size of a starbase. This sort of scale really breaks my immersion in the world as there is no real reason for it, especially on a spaceship where space is a commodity, no matter what era you're in. It made for an epic couple of fight scenes, but the sheer lunacy of this layout still bugs me. Speaking of cool scenes, the warp core explosion was sweet. I like a good core breach, and I enjoyed it as the victory boom it was, safe in the knowledge that the USS Discovery was completely fine. They weren't going to kill off the full crew despite rumours that they'd be on a new ship come season 4. However, what was the point of the DOTs? The cliffhanger for last episode had the sphere data present itself in the droids, then they did nothing except drag Oo to safety. Wouldn't they have been the perfect foil to combat the life support shutoff? Again, their role seemed tacked on and could easily have been replaced. So, Burnham gets command of the Discovery at the end of it all, which was frankly expected, I feel. Vance made a speech to her about how glad he is that her way of doing things worked out, despite it not being the proper way. This is a sentiment very much reflected in TNG era crews when they look back to the 23rd century ships. There's a line from Janeway about the TOS era, that people like Kirk had to bend the rules a little and would be booted out of Starfleet today. And this episode did a lot to try to emphasise that Burnham and the crew of the Discovery are very much from that time. With Michael even indirectly quoting Kirk with his philosophy on no-win scenarios. What has worked for Starfleet has done well to maintain it in dire times, but it needed a shake-up to get things moving again, and for this, Vance seems equal parts grateful and surprised. Honestly, if the writers had put Burnham in the command chair at any point prior to this, I would have thought it unearned. But Season 3 did a lot to develop her character in a clear way that has improved it loads, so I'm alright with this choice, although I'm curious to see where Tilly goes now. I assume she's still the acting XO, but when Saru returns, what then? Will he be demoted to commander again, as his captaincy was in actuality self-appointed by the crew and not officialised? I hope he remains a captain, even if that means he gets his own vessel, but it would be strange to see a discovery without him in that case. When it all wraps up with Burnham accepting captaincy of the discovery, I was happy to see them all change over to the 32nd century uniforms, and I'm eager to see what exploration in this era looks like as Starfleet and the Federation rebuilds. Did anyone else get the feeling that Admiral Vance's family is long dead? The evasive way he answers Burnham's inquiry about it very much had a note of regret to it, and we had that line from him earlier to Stamets about he understands exactly what he's asking Stamets to give up in regards to Hugh. Hmm. Uh, speaking of Stamets, there wasn't much time in the closing montages to have a scene between Burnham and him, but there is definitely unresolved issues here from those glances at the end. The way Stamets was treated in the last two episodes has been horrid. Necessary, yes, because he was a security risk. But now he's no longer needed as part of the ship to fly it, coupled with his treatment at the hands of Michael and Vance, I wouldn't be surprised if he has serious doubts about staying in Starfleet. We end off with a quote from Roddenberry about how connections are important among people, which was the apparent theme of this season since early on. 
and throughout Season 3, this has been an identifiable constant, seldom muddied or lost. Not to mention a very Trek-like core message, far more consistently displayed than in the past. With that, Discovery Season 3 is done. Let me know if you'd want a full series overview or something similar, but in short this has been the best series of Discovery so far, which admittedly isn't a high bar, but after the course correction Season 2 attempted, at least this one made clear that it's found its footing. I could harp on about how much Series 1 damaged continuity and so forth, but it's all been said before and what's done is done. Series 3 was the first one where I was actually going into every episode with less apprehension, <laughs> and if it continues to follow this trend, I'm glad. So thanks for watching my reviews. I've been Rick, and I'll find something else to fill the Sunday slot with. Until then, thanks again for watching, and I'll see you later. Goodbye.